I did want to say at the outset, I don't know if you have any elementary age children uh, with you in the service, um, I would encourage you to go ahead and uh, take them over to uh, Children's Church this morning. And, uh, and, and so I, I don't think anything's going to be embarrassing to anybody here, but, uh, but what I do have to say is uh, s- some plain talk. And so, and, uh, and I am going to be probably using the word sex uh, way more often than I would usually mention it on a given Sunday morning because we're having a sex talk. Uh, and so, um, so I, I, I would encourage you again, I haven't looked around, try to see, but if you need to do that, please feel free. Or if you feel like, uh, anyway, what, just notice I said that. Okay. So don't blame me later if you're going, well, why didn't you tell me? I, I just told you, um, I want to, uh, have a word of prayer before we dive into this, because it's a, it's an incredibly important topic. And, uh, and I, I've kind of, you know, we're doing this study on Joseph, and uh, and so the context of Joseph's life and how this relates to that is uh, is is kind of one genre. I decided to expand it out a little bit beyond that because uh, it's not a topic we talk about every day, uh, but at the same time, I think it's very vital and important. So uh, I'm going to ask ask for God's special uh, wisdom as we share today, Jesus. Uh, when you were on this earth, you spoke to so many topics. Uh, sometimes uh, people tried to uh, put you in a corner about some things, and sometimes you just refused to go in that corner and to be pegholed that closely on certain things. There were other things that you were crystal clear, so crystal clear that you just ticked people off. And so it really wasn't about whether people liked what you said or didn't like. You just tried to speak the truth. But what we love about you, Jesus, is that you always spoke the truth in love. And we believe even in your harshest denouncements, the people you did, you, that, that you spoke the most clearly against were those who were self-righteous, those who believed their own good things, good deeds, good actions, we're going to rescue them from eternity away from God and place them securely in the front lines of heaven. And so, God, you, through the person of Jesus, you came into our world and you demonstrated to us how to be a person of boldness and courage to address whatever needed to be addressed, but to do it in such a way that it was always grace-oriented. It was always for redemptive purposes. And I believe your harsh words for the Pharisees were redemptive. These people were blind, they could not see. And so when you called them white sepulchers, you, you, you called them out various things, you were just trying to unveil the truth to them so they could see and change their ways. Um, God, for the broken, beat down people who had no problem saying, I'm a wretch, I'm a wreck, I'm a mess, I'm a I'm, I'm even people who were wealthy or people who were poor. Um, your compassion was so strong as you reached out to them. So, Lord, the spirit that I come to today is one of instruction, one of uh, of training, of 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 encouragement, and also of of correction if need be. But I come with the spirit of Christ that says we love and value every person here. We will speak the truth. We will do it in a way we believe that reflects your spirit in your heart of redemption. We ask these things in your name. Amen. I was on, I, this past week, I actually had to be gone uh, for several days. Uh, the first piece of the week, I was uh, at a, a what they called a mid-sized church conference in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. And it was sponsored by the Wesleyan Church. Uh, for churches kind of in our size and up from there, maybe like five, 600 in attendance. And, uh, and, and on my way back from that trip, I was, uh, I won't tell you about my airplane experiences, but they were not that pleasant. Um, when you're a large person and for some reason they decide to put the, the largest person with another large person in the same two seats, 
I just promise you, I was very happy to get to breathe again, you know, after, and I'm sure they were too. So anyway, that was, that was part of my experience. The best, the best peat leg of it that I had was with an elderly lady, and we were literally on the very, very back two seats of the airplane, very, very back. And I was comforted by that because I remember Mark Lowry, who's a comedian, saying that, uh, that he, he, always, uh, he always picked seats at the very back of the airplane. And he says, some people say, well, Mark, why do you do that? He says, well, have you ever seen an airplane crash with the nose of the airplane sticking up like that? He says, it's always the tail sticking up. He goes, if I ever had a chance, at least sitting in that back seat maybe, you know. So anyway, so I was feeling pretty comforted, you know, I was back there. Well, this, this elderly lady, um, I'm going to say late 70s, uh, approaching 80 at least probably, um, just started engaging me in conversation. And, uh, and she uh, was she's a Lutheran by birth kind of and then probably by conversion and that kind of thing. But she said, you know, there's, she's, she, I, I don't know how we got onto the topic because I didn't bring up anything, but she kept bringing it up. And uh, so I felt compelled to dive in with her. And, uh, and so she, um, she started asking me questions and what she found out uh, what I did uh, for a living and, uh, and that I was a believer. And so she started asking me questions about this the whole Jesus thing. She said, I've, she said, just, she goes, even though I've been raised and I know the creeds, I know the Bible, I know all these different things, I'm just going, why does it have to be so exclusive? Why does it have to be just this Jesus thing? She goes, there's a couple phrases in the Bible that just really bother me. There's no other name under heaven why you be saved. And I said, well, I, I, let me give you a, a feeble best response that I can to that. And that is, if I could find somebody else some other person, whoever showed up on the face of this earth, with the amount of prophecies fulfilled in their life and the kind of credibility in you have to, you may not believe in the resurrection, but if you believe that he rose from the grave, then if I could find somebody else who had, who had gone through the things that Jesus did, spoken the kinds of words that he did and lived the kind of life he did and fulfilled the things that he did, if I could find somebody else that was even comparable to that, then I would, I would agree with you. I would go, then why only him? But after quite a long period of time of actually looking at other people of note uh, that are noteworthy in the, in, in the religious circles and different religions and things like that, I still can't find anybody who quite comes to the point of being a redeemer or the savior uh, or the promised one, the Messiah, like Jesus does. And, um, and so in the course of that whole conversation, what, you know, I, I think what she was struggling with, there were people in her lives, in her life that were not following this path. And I think what she wanted to do was be able to say, well, they're okay. They're going to be okay anyway. So even if they don't do the Jesus thing, just tell me they're going to be okay. Well, I said, I'm not God and I'm not, I'm not the judge. That's a good thing because I would miss it every time. But they're still alive, they're still living, they're still, and I said just, I would encourage you to pray for them and to, uh, and not badger them, but pray for spiritual influences in their lives, direct them toward uh, Christ as a savior. But the idea that I had at the end of that was, if the Bible wasn't quite lining up with what she wanted it to say, then she was working real hard at wanting to pull that part of it out. And, you know, I know that the history of how the Bible came together and everything, there are some flaws in it. And she brought up about there was a book found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, you know, I mean, she had she'd thought about this. This wasn't just an off-the-cuff thing. She had thought about it. She had read some stuff. She would watched some stuff. She would listened to She said there was, you know, it actually portrayed Jesus as, as he would killed somebody. And, he, you know, she's, you know, sharing this stuff. And I said, let me just ask you this. Since you've been around the church a very long time, you've been around the Bible, and you understand a lot of things about the Bible. Does that in any way seem consistent with the Jesus of the Bible? Well, no, it doesn't, you know. And I said, I, you know, I, I think that there are all kinds of arguments. You can come up with all things. But at the end of the day, there's a certain consistency that flows through the scriptures. There's a certain reliability that seems somewhat predictable within the word of God. 
is it, is it flawless in the sense of us perfectly understanding everything or being able to explain every little nuance? I mean, some people think they can. I'm just honest enough to say, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to, there's certain little arguments I'm, I can't really have because, because I, I can't absolutely prove something. There's certain things I can't absolutely prove. I can't absolutely prove God even exists. But you're going to have a very hard time talking me out of it because I've come to have this confidence that not only is God real, but his word is very reliable. Now, we live in a time period where things try to be, they keep trying to redefine history, redefine all kinds of things. And, you know, that's just how life goes, how people do. But I will tell you, there has to come a point, we all make a decision what we're going to base our life on. And if you don't base it on God's word, then I hope you base it on something and I hope that something seems as reliable as what the word of God seems. Now, in, in, in all honesty, today I'm not here to prove the reliability of the scripture. I believe it. I'm going to preach from it with that belief. But I'm not here to prove it today. I don't, if you have issues with that, we can talk later one-on-one. -on -one. I may do a series with regard to that. But I believe God's word is true. That's my own personal belief. And as a church, we take that position we also take the position that God loves every person deeply and that all of us are flawed by sin. All of us are marred. We all come broken. I, I, I listened to a song this morning. It was a series of songs I was just using in sort of some preparation for my own heart this morning. And uh, have any of you heard the song, Broken Hallelujah? If you haven't, you just need to go look it up on YouTube or something, you know, and play that song, Broken Hallelujah. I need to announce to everyone here today, if you're a Christ follower, if you're someone who is claiming to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're on your way to heaven, and your life has been changed, I need to tell you this, that all of us in our hallelujah to God, it's a broken one. It comes out of brokenness. It comes out of sin. It comes out of things that we've done that have done damage to our lives and many times other people's lives. It's a broken hallelujah. But through Christ, it's a genuine hallelujah. It's a forgiven hallelujah. It's, it's, a, it's a response of praise to God that has been made right. Our brokenness has been made right through what Christ has done. So I know you're going, I thought we were having a sex talk. Well, we are, but I just wanted to start from the basis of saying that there's a few things I'm going to say today that you may not agree with. That's okay. I mean, I, when I say that's okay, I'm saying, you know, I can't, I can't make people believe anything. I've given that up a long time ago. But I'm going to share what I believe is the truth, and, uh, and I'm going to ask you to give careful consideration to it. And, uh, and, I, and I will just tell you straight up how we deal with people who, who completely ignore a lot of things I'm going to say here today is we, we deal with them out of the graciousness of God's love. Uh, I've had many, many friends over the years that I've worked with, ministered to, that have come in and through these doors here that um, disagreed like crazy with all kinds of stuff that I'm gonna say here today. And I didn't treat them like the ugly stepsister or something else. Uh, we, we loved them, we cared for them. Did we hope they would move in a direction toward uh, what we consider greater awareness of what Christ says? Yes, but, um, but, but we still love them. Let's begin with uh, our memory verse. It says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness. These are two action, there are two action words here in this phrase. Um, it flee and pursue, and they're both action words. They're like, they're, you're supposed to run away from some things, but sometimes as a church, we've told people, hey, run away from the devil. You know, run away from this, run away from that. And um, the question is, okay, what am I just doing? Trying to outrun the devil? You know, I mean, is that my, is that my life calling? I gotta outrun the devil? No, that's not your life calling. Run to something, pursue something, run from those things that will destroy your life, but don't just run randomly out there like I'm being chased by the devil. Let me tell you, the devil will get you on a long run chase if he can do it. Don't do that. You just walk away from him intentionally and you go to something better. And here's the better. And notice this is a much bigger part of this verse. It says, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. In other words, join up with some other people who are saying, 
I'm going to live life the way God designed us to live life. I'm going to pursue life that way. And don't become a lot of you know, self-righteous bigots. You just end up becoming people who encourage each other along the way, and you're looking for others that are fleeing away from those things that are wrong to join you in this pursuit of a life that's worth living. And so fleeing the devil just simply means really saying no and walking away and being determined about it. It's a decision. I am not going to go down that path. I'm going to go down this one. And the path you should choose is to choose, uh, is, is to choose the path of righteousness, faith, love, and peace with other people who are endeavoring to do the same through the power of Jesus Christ. Now, having set that as a bit of a framework, we're going to work our way down through some ideas about sex. And uh, the first thing that I want to share with you is this. Sex is God's idea. It's not Hollywood's idea. It's not pornography's idea. It's not any other venue. It's not the adult bookstore's idea. It's, it's, it, is, it is God's idea. God's the one who came up with this. And I will have to tell you this. If you, you know, if, if you don't believe that God is a part of the creation process, then what I would say is this. What I would say is this. That was some pretty creative happenings that happened, you know, uh, the sex thing. That was like, that was pretty, pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. Far as I can see it and I view it, it is God's idea. And, uh, and actually, I think God thought it was a really good idea. Now, I have a couple questions for God when, he, when we get to heaven. And one is, why did he make it such a powerful idea? Because it creates a lot of problems in our culture, in our lives, everything else. Because it's such a powerful idea. It's like, you know, could have you just weakened it a little bit, you know? Just, uh, you know, let's like drop the edge off of it a little bit. And uh, I don't know what his answer will be. And probably get to heaven, we won't even think to ask that question. But anyway, I've thought about asking him that. And, and it seems like a lot of problems here on earth. A lot of people problems, everything else, kind of come back to this issue here. Um, the other, you know, question that I would like to ask is, since I think it was God's idea for a man and woman to be together, why did he make women so complicated? Now, that's, I'm talking as a guy, okay? I'm the guy talking. Why did he make them so complicated? Uh, I, I know, if some lady wants to come up and get fair time, go ahead and come up here, you know, right now. But no. Um, I, I, you know, I'm going to tell you what I think women would say if someone, woman comes to say, I'm going to be honest, she would go, why, God, why did you make men so dumb? You know, just dumb. Like, they like walk around, duh, duh, duh. Hey. And then all of a sudden they go, yeah, you want to oh, Zach, you know, like, and so men are, anyway, we're, we're, just, we're just so different. And it's like, and so I think that's part of the whole creative skill of God to do that. But it's like, sometimes it is like mind boggling. So B is this, here's what I actually believe if we look at the scripture, what God teaches us about sex, what it really is for. I believe sex is designed for intimacy. In other words, that we could become one flesh. As Genesis 2.24 says, right in the creation of mankind, man and woman, that we would become one flesh, that we would, we would, we would, it would be such an intimate physical relationship that, um, that there would be a bond that would be, that would, that would, we'd like to say unbreakable. Unfortunately, we live in a world where it's broken very easily, but, uh, but, but I believe that's God's intent, that people would be, have that intimacy that can only come from that, that experience of the sexual relationship. And then I believe God created sex for pleasure. Um, in Hebrews 13, 4, it, it talks about the marriage bed being undefiled. It, it, there's a, the, probably the core context of that or the meaning of that is don't bring other people into that mix by going someplace and doing things. Don't keep it to yourselves. Keep the marriage bed, the marriage place between a man and a woman in that place together. Don't, don't go find somebody else to bring into the mix of your sexual relationships. Don't uh, bring people into that. Don't, don't, don't corrupt that relationship. But I also believe as you look at 
the different things that are said, whether it's in you know Corinthians, uh, you know Genesis, or very and, and certainly Song of Solomon itself, just the whole book. Uh, there is a pleasure aspect that we know is real in sex. You know, if at least you're you know adult age here and and have experience, you know it's real. It's very very real, and it's a strong strong the strong pull that we're talking about. And so I believe God said. Look, you know, life might be hard sometimes. It might be difficult, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you feel good sometimes. And this is one of the ways you're going to feel good. You're going to be able to experience pleasure. You could be poor as a church mouse. Actually, I'm thinking church mice aren't that poor because, you know, there's always some food in the kitchen. But anyway, but, so we need to come up with something else than a church mouse. But you can be as poor as the poorest mouse out there, okay, whoever that is. Or you can be wealthy but everybody can experience this pleasure. There's an equality to that that God says, you know, you may not live a life of luxury and you may not have this or have that or do, but you've got this. This is a gift I've given to you for pleasure. Procreation is the third one. Procreation, he told them in, uh, in Genesis 128, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. You know, you have to determine yourself how fruitful you need to be and how multiplied you need to be. And we, you know, uh, but, but that purpose is there. It's one of the purposes for God's idea of sex. And then number four, I believe if you look through the scripture, you'll see that a man and a woman in marriage relationship is God's plan for sex. And uh, again, I'm not reading all these verses to you. They're there for you to go back and look at for yourself. We're going to be looking more at the story of Joseph when we get to that point, okay? Uh, number th- and the, the next part is three reasons why recreational, casual, or live in sex doesn't work out so well. Now, I, I know, I don't, you know, I never calculated, I don't ever come here to this place to preach to somebody. So I, I really have no person in mind. I can think over the years of many, many people that we've had be a part of our church that have, you know, lived together before marriage and that kind of thing. It's not, uh, it's extremely common in our culture. But, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm separately just mentioning this. I wanna, I, wanna be, I wanna be honest with you and fair with you what I believe that God says about that. And, um, and, 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 and also with regard to recreational or casual sex as well as living together uh, before marriage. Number one, the inventor, speaking of God, the one who had this idea, says it shouldn't be used that way. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, it talks about that when we live in sexual immorality, what we're doing is we're just living according to the flesh. This is certainly not a spirit-led kind of life uh, lifestyle. We're living according to the flesh. And uh, there's nothing in Scripture that encourages or says this is a good way to live. Even in cases in the Old Testament where, where there was polygamy where there were actually people who loved God, followed God, but had multiple wives. If you remember, when David went outside of his marriage bonds and uh, had sex with Bathsheba, there was a great price to be paid for that. Uh, it was, it was, it was, he, he, he went against, even, you know, even though you could say, well, he had more than one wife, he did have more than one wife, and I'm not here to deal with polygamy today, per se, uh, I'm not trying to avoid it. I can only fit so much into the sermon. I'm like, as I was going here, I'm going, I think this needs to be a series. I don't know if everybody has to stick with me for a series, but anyway. Um, and, and, so, and so, but God's original idea and throughout scripture, we see his design really points toward a man and a woman being together in a committed relationship called marriage. And, uh, and so Galatians 5.19 gives us some insight into that, many other scriptures. Number two, when you have sex recreationally or casual or just living together, it's giving the keys to your house to a stranger. Let me, this is something that confuses me a little bit with the casual sex idea in particular um, or, or recreational sex, and that is this. And because I've pastored for 30 years, and had many hundreds of conversations over the years with people about these very topics. I, um, I'm not unaware, not fully aware, I think, of you know, how things go, roll out there. But, um, 
but I do have a, a, a distinct awareness of it and uh, have had some calls late at night or the next morning or something like that with people just saying that they had gone out drinking and, you know, ended up taking a young guy home with them from the bar and he's gone, of course, and probably never to see again and just this deep agony and pain rolling off of them. Um, and too many stories like that. Uh, and guys tell me they have no idea. They, they can't even remember who all they've had sex with. They've had sex with so many people. That's, you know, I'm not here to beat anybody up with that. Okay, you, you're going, well, this is my story. You're talking my story or whatever. I'm not talking anybody's given story. I'm just saying these are things in general that I know I've heard. Here's, here's, here's what I've Here's what I'd like to encourage you wherever you are today. I'm not here to beat you up about where you've been. I'm here to say, here we are today as we go forward. I want you to think about it this way. Probably most of you have given a key to your house to somebody besides your family. There's a high chance you've given it to a relative, to a next door neighbor, to a friend, but it's generally, it's someone you trust. And you really don't, you don't, you don't give them that key saying, in most cases, unless, again, there's some unique relationship sometimes where this might be the case, you don't give them that, that key saying, hey, listen, you know, whenever we're gone, you know, we're gone for an afternoon or something like that, just go rummage through the house, you know? Just go in and just make yourself home rummage through the house. Through, you know, look through the drawers, you know, get in the, get in the closets and, you know, check things out. You, you, that's not why you give them the key. You give them the key in case you lock yourself out or in case you're gone for a week or two. But I would also guarantee you this, even if you have someone a key, there are some parts of your house you still have secured in such a way you'd prefer them not to get there because it has you know your birth certificate it has your divorce decree it has your you know it has all these important papers in there it might tell your net worth or it might say something about an investment you have or your portfolio of some kind or whatever you might uh, it might have your bank, bank's, bank identification stuff, your bank cards, but you've got to place some place where you have secured information that you don't even necessarily want the person who has a key to the house to have access to that. And you might even have it at a lockbox in the bank. It's intriguing to me how we will protect titles deeds, certificates, and all kinds of very important papers and then do our best to keep them fireproofed and locked down so that just anybody can't get to them. But then give away the deepest places and parts of ourselves to absolute strangers. And you say, well, I would never do that. I know the vast majority of you would never do that. Or if you have done that, you probably wouldn't. I'm just simply trying to help us understand the battle with the flesh is powerful. And the damage that it does to the souls, to our souls, to our minds, to our hearts, to our lives is significant when we allow people into the deeper places of our lives and really take something from us, you may say, well, I gave it to them. Well, if you gave it to them, you did give it to them. There's something gone from you to them. How many pieces do you have? How shattered can your life be? So you say, well, Rod, I'm already feeling bad enough. Could we just stop this sermon right here? No, but I, I'm, don't, please don't do that. I'm not talking about where you've been talking about where you are today from this day forward. We can't go back and change anything in the past. I'm talking about from this day forward. Don't give the keys to your soul, to your body, to somebody who has not committed their life to you. Don't do it. Just asking you not to. Number three is the responsibility of procreation. The Bible tells us that if you don't take care of your family, that you're actually worse than an infidel, somebody who's in absolute disdain of who God is. 
And uh, that's found in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 there. And here's what I want to say to you. Casual sex, recreational sex, living sex, I know there's protection and all these kinds of things, but you don't know how many stories over the years I've heard of how protection didn't work, how that, you know, we, oh, we were shocked more than anybody else, you know? It's like, well, you, you weren't shocked that you had sex. You were just shocked at the result of that sexual experience. And so, um, and so, so if you have sex with somebody, what you are saying is this. There's a chance that you and I are going to become parents of a child because things don't always go right, even if you're using protection. And I just want to say this, and this, again, I don't, I'm not here dealing with your past. I'm dealing from here on forward. Could I just say this? Children deserve better than that. I, I hear stories all the time of people saying, and I've experienced it up close and personal and, and, and family members of my own life, and that is that there's, there's you know, this sense of which something happens like, well, we don't really, we, didn't, we really never were in love anyway. My question is then why were you having sex? But anyway, that's, I know that's prudish and very old mannish of me or whatever, but, the, but I'm just serious, I do mean that question. Because it does bring with it the capability of having a child, and then that child faces the possibility of being raised without one of their parents. I don't care if you write a fat check every month, everything else, there's damage done to that child. And they didn't deserve it. So if you're in that situation, you've, you've been in that situation, you are in that situation, please understand I'm not beating you up for that. Because... because, because life happens and things happen. But I am asking from this point forward, if you could f- just say, I need, to, I need to really give some pause and think this through about how I want to live my life from this point on. You know, God doesn't, I'm not here to hold anything over what he said. I'm not talking, again, I'm not talking about the past. I want to preserve the future. I want to work toward the future, okay? So please understand that heart. Number, the next section here is three reasons why homosexual sex is not a good idea. I know this is an extremely big hot button in our culture. Actually, that's one of the reasons I'm talking about it is because it is. Because I believe believe there are several conversations going on with regard to this. And one of them is is that nobody can talk about it unless you're celebrating it. And I want to tell you on record that don't fall into that trap. This can be talked about without celebrating it. And, and, and if you lose that right, it'll just be many, many other rights that you're going to lose to be able to talk about something that, that, and, and share your view or opinion. Now, what I would also say is this. Remember how Jesus responded to people in particular that were broken and were hurting and were living immoral lives. He, he responded to those people with deep compassion and love. And he reached out to them and he cared deeply about them. And so... There, there's, there's, this isn't a, this, you know, I think what happens sometimes in the context of the church or Christianity, what happens is it becomes an us versus them. It becomes this battle, this fight. And, and I'm not in a fight with anybody. I'm not in a battle in that sense. I, I, I don't, I don't want the government or anybody else telling me that I can't speak on any topic, no matter what it is, not just homosexuality, but any topic. I don't want, uh, that's, that is not acceptable to me it has nothing to do with that homosexual is one of those areas where it's becoming uh, harder and harder to be able to speak outright about that without there being a pretty hard flashback on it. I just have to tell you, I will declare God's word no matter what the, what the outcome of that is. Okay. And, uh, and, 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 but I will do it in such a way I need to explain to you straight up front. Uh, Vanji has a cousin that's a homosexual and he's also an Episcopalian priest, active Episcopalian priest. Uh, I, uh, I have many people I've ministered to over the years that are homosexuals. And if I could line those people up here today and they would speak on my behalf, minus maybe one, but, but, but my converse, my converse station that went south with him had nothing to do with homosexuality. I didn't know he was one. Okay. But, but if I could line these folks up here and they would operate, they would be in the dozens. If I could line them up here today and have them speak and say, how did Rod treat me? And you ask them the question, how did Rod treat you when this issue came up and you were dealing with it? And I believe, minus the one person that, again, my interaction had nothing to do with homosexuality, but minus that one person, all of them would say, he loved me, he cared about me, he prayed with me, he was willing to help me, he was there for me, 
and I still feel like I call him today if I need to talk to him. I really believe that. Now, they're not here in this sense, and I'm not, you know, it, it, but I, I truly feel that in my spirit. So I'm not against people, no matter what they're dealing with, what they're struggling with. If, you know, you're in a live-in situation today, and I've talked about that issue, understand you're not my enemy. I love you. I care about you. I disagree with you living together before marriage, but I don't, I'm not against you. I'm for you. So if someone's here today and you're homosexual, I need to tell you. Or if you have close relatives that are or anything else, I need to tell you, I am not opposed to people who are homosexuals. I love those people. I care about those people. It's the same that I would anybody else. And so why are we talking about it? Because it's a sexual issue and because it is an issue that is really being talked about today. And there's, there is a lot of distortion regarding it. So I want to go ahead and just put a couple things on the table here with regard to it. Number one is the inventor says it shouldn't be used that way. That sexuality should not be used that way. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 says that God gave people over to what he considered to be unnatural affections. And, uh, and so that they begin to have lust for people of the same sex. And so that's what the scripture says. That's what it, what it uh, plainly says. And so God said, the one whose sex was his idea said, this really isn't what I designed it for. And uh, then the second one is, and this is more like just on a, a way that I process things a little bit. This isn't from a Bible verse, okay? But I think there's a plumbing problem. And, uh, and I'm not trying to be lighthearted or weird or anything else. I'm just simply saying th there's, if you just from an anatomy standpoint analyze this thing out, there's a basic plumbing problem. I'm going to leave it at that. You can do with that what you want to do with it, okay? But that's, that's my perspective, and I'm willing to have a greater conversation about it. I view it as a plumbing problem, uh, and I'm just sharing that as, as a point of view. Number three, the procreation rate is still zero. If everybody were homosexuals, we'd all die out within a few generations. And I know some people say, well, everybody isn't. They're not all going to be and everything else. But sex, if part of sex's design is for the possibility of procreation, then it's missing one of the key components of what God designed it for. And I think it's at least something for someone to, to think about. Now, um, the next section here is the heart of my sermon. And it's going to be a little heart, okay? So don't get too worried. How to personally protect this amazing gift of sex that God has entrusted you. How do you, how do you protect that? How do, you, how do you use it properly and how do you make it work for you? Would I say this is a perfect formula? Probably not, but I think it's a good one, and I think it's one that is God honoring. Number one, find the right person and get married. If you want to have sex, get married. Now, don't go out and just grab the first person you see, please. I mean, that, that's like, and, 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 and let me also say this. I'm going to say this in defense of everybody who's sitting here and thinking, you know, Rod, everything you're saying sounds good, and, it, you know, and I know it kind of makes sense and all that stuff, but realistically, Marriage isn't working. Marriage is not working. Would we agree that marriage in our culture is, is not working very well? And, 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 I, and so it, that is true. And I would say if there's anything that as a church we ought to be doing is really endeavoring to focus on making our marriages work, making them work. And I'm going to give you a few clues here on how to do that, I think. So just going out and getting married won't fix things. If you have a sexual addiction of any kind, whether it's pornography or something else, I, you know, just because you're, you get married, it's not going to, that doesn't fix it. There's way too many testimonies of people who are married who are, who are sexual addicts. Way too many. So if you're a sexual addict, that's a personal issue for you. That's not a marriage issue. Marriage won't fix everything, but at least will provide an area or an avenue for you to legitimately be in a sexual relationship. So, but you got to get that right person, okay? And I know that can be hard. But some people just put it off, put it off too long. Just, hey, you know, you, 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 the reason you are not going to find Miss Perfect or Mr. Perfect, can I let you in a clue? It's because you're not Mr. Perfect or Miss Perfect. So you can't, you can't get perfect if you're not, all right? So you have to just kind of look in the mirror and go, hey, size this up a little bit. Let's be realistic, and then let's find something compatible here. Okay, number two. Hey, I, I'm just being, I'm trying to be truthful, okay? I'm not trying to be uh, rude or obnoxious. Um, number two. And most married men should appreciate this, and most women should too, but have sex often. Have sex often. 
I, you know, I, I used to kind of declare how often people would have it, and it's like, you know, you can't determine that for people. I mean, some people are just wired, high-wired, some are low-wired, some are, you know, it's just, but everybody's wired, I know that, unless something's wrong with them. They're all wired. So, um, so, so this isn't, you know, I did know this coming in here. This isn't one of those subjects where there'll be a section of people going, well, I have no clue what he's talking about. This doesn't relate to me. No, it does relate to you. It's, it's, it's real for all of us here, Okay. Nobody's exempt from this one. So if you're in a marriage, have sex often. You say, how much is often? Why don't you guys decide that? You know, For some people, having it every week would be often. And some people would be going, oh, I'll never survive if I only had it once. You know, so find out what works for you guys. And then I will tell you this. Probably you and your spouse are not exactly on the same page. You know, Because one of you might say, well, every day it'd be just fine with me. You know? And I had someone, when I said that one time, come up to me and go, what about twice a day? You, know, like, like you can't ever please some people. You know, That's not... Um, so, so, but if you feel that way, probably your spouse is thinking, you know, you may be thinking once a day and they're thinking, eh, once a week's pretty good for me. You know, so you're going to have to find a compromise. You're going to have to find something that works for you guys, for both of you. Um, but first Corinthians chapter seven, read those verses one through five. And, and, you know, Paul first encourages, Hey, don't get married if you don't have to, but, but go ahead if you need to. And I'm just going to tell you what my opinion is about 98, 99% of people need to go ahead and get married. That's what they need to do. Uh, and so uh, I, Paul, you know, he thought everybody could be like him. They can't all be like him. Um, and so, so um, have sex often. Number three, be thoughtful and creative. I said creative, not weird, okay? You know, I mean, I, 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 I'm only, I'm only going to take that, you know, just, I'm going to leave that alone, really. But I'm just simply saying, if you think your spouse has a problem you might have one, and they may not, but that, but uh, you know, but one time, many years ago, I encouraged somebody to go for sex therapy, and I'm just going to tell you, I might as well have told him I was going to kill him or something. You know, what I mean, that man, he wanted to kill me. I can tell you, he's like, you think I have a problem? I don't have a problem. I'm not, you know, I, I, I ruined the ego there completely. So I'm really, so I'm not going to tell him to go to sex therapy individually. But if you, if you guys can't get it together, you can't get it figured out, then maybe you need to. But that, that was like a general statement. Probably nobody needs that. But anyway, just in case. Uh, number four, guard against temptation. Guard against temptation. I mean, we just live in a world where, where it's a vulnerable world. It's a, sexually. It's a, it's a, it's a, it is just... It's kind of everywhere. I mean, you can't get away from it. The media, you know, online, everything. It's just, you know, and, and, you know, you can be sitting there at your computer and just work, and all of a sudden it has, you know, date people that are 30 or date people that are whatever, you know. There's advertisements here, there, everywhere. You know, and if, if, if you're alone too long, there's that possibility that you might be start going, well, I wonder what, wonder, that's, that's pretty, that person's pretty pretty. I wonder if they really are available out there. I wonder what, you know, you can just start, it's just so many ways you can go down a pathway that leads to a, a distraction and ultimately maybe to a failure of your marriage. So Genesis chapter 39, verses five to 20, because of time, I'm not gonna read the verses to you. This is a story from Joseph. This is a passage I really wanted to focus on, the heart of what I wanted to focus on, and I am gonna focus on, but I'm, but I'm gonna hope that if you don't know the story well, this is where he, Joseph was a slave in Potiphar's house, and his wife actually took a liking to him. And we're going to talk about why she did in just a moment. But um, so she just came on to him, came on to him, came on to him. Whenever he refused, she finally grabbed his coat and held on to that. He fled anyway. And then she used his coat as a way of, and they were the only two in the house at that time, used his coat as a way to tell all the other servants Remember, he was head servant, so you're going to have some enemies in there, okay, who were very, very glad to get rid of their boss, probably jealous of him and everything else. So they're chiming in with her. Her husband comes in. She tells him a story. He gets thrown in prison because he did the right thing and resisted temptation. He did something, I'm going to say that I don't want to give a percent to it, very high percentage of guys who were in this situation would have a very hard time having resisted this. I mean, unless she was, like, ugly real bad, you know, like real, I don't think, that's the part of the story we don't know. We know he was handsome. We don't know for sure what she looked like, you know, so it might have been just easy, you know, I mean, it might have been like, I had no problem with this. Ain't no way, baby, you know, I mean, so we, I don't, you know, I don't want to give him credit that maybe he didn't deserve, but I'm thinking the way he handled this, it was like, 
it, it was some temptation here, without a doubt. Okay. Um, sometimes it'd be good if the Bible told us more, because then our imaginations work, you know. Um, here are some things to pay attention to. Never under, underestimate the power or appeal of the flesh. You know, I, I, I always, I, it's good to declare, I will never be unfaithful to my wife. I'll never be unfaithful to my husband. It's good to declare that. But don't let that declaration cause you to put your guard down. You know, because people are known to do things they said they would never do. And it's not just because you said you never would. It's just because maybe sometimes when you say you never would, you kind of are disarmed now. Well, I've got that taken care of. The flesh is very, very powerful. And there's a great appeal there. In verses 5 and 6, basically it said that Joseph was well-built and he was handsome. In other words, I mean, this, this guy was a catch. I mean, he was, he was young. Uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he, he would have been a youthful man. And he was well designed, and he was good looking. I mean, Scripture says that. It's 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 a, uh, and, and I looked at, I looked at the original words and everything else, and that's what it means. I mean, you know, they wouldn't just flower this up in English. That's what it means. He was he was well built, and well put together, very good features, a handsome guy. So, you may be blessed with beauty, but just remember this. Other people would love to cash in on your beauty. They would love to cash in on what God has given you as a gift to your spouse and disrupt that. And, and if, if you happen to be a beautiful person, I don't care who you are, who we are, any of us, we all like to be stroked. And we get used to hearing people say things to us and it makes us feel good. If you find yourself enjoying the comments of someone other than your spouse a little too much, you better push back from the table and walk away. Train yourself to say no, even if approached with an illicit opportunity. I believe Joseph had already made up his mind about certain things. He had already predetermined some things. And he was saying he had a no going on for this from the get-go. He, 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 I don't know whether he saw it coming or not, but he was... He, he was no straight up front. He was, he was absolutely, there was just, it was like, I, I've committed to this and I'm not looking back and I'm not going down this road. The third one is, remember your marriage vows to your spouse and to God. And if you gave marriage vows with a pastor presiding particularly, you not only were making those vows to each other, but you were making them to God and it was clearly stated and in front of other people. Sometimes we just need to remember our vows. Maybe you're having a hard day in your marriage. You just need to remember you said, for better or what? To say, today's one of those worst, but I'm still married. I'm still married, and I'm married to worse today. That's okay, you know. It'll get, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for better to show up tomorrow, you know. Uh, because, you know, all of us are a little bit... Um, multi-personality, you know, we're just praying for that better personality to show up the next day, you know, so pray for that. But, but you, you remember your vows. Remember them. If you don't remember them, it's going to be easy to be weakened because here's what I typically hear when relationships are falling apart. Here's what I typically hear, especially the person who's wanting to walk away from it all. They have already created this arsenal of reasons why they're justified in walking away and, and why it will never work out. Now, I'm just going to tell you, if I catch somebody at that point in the journey, the chances of undoing that are really, really slim. I've seen it happen a few times, but it's really, really slim. So I'm going to tell you this. If you feel like your marriage is getting into some trouble, please Please, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do as much counseling as I used to. It's part of it's because the church has grown and because of right of ministries that we've, we've, we've begun that, uh, that, that take a little different kind of uh, rescheduling of time. But, uh, but I'm always willing to meet people a time or two, and oftentimes I will, count, I will refer them on to someone else. And, um, and so, but, but, but you just go get help. You don't have to come here for it. You don't, you're welcome to come or you're welcome to ask for, uh, for, um, for 
maybe names of people, and uh, and depending on your situation, would depend on who we might recommend. But we have a couple really good counselors right here in our church, uh, Rick and Billy. And sometimes people want to do that with people they know, and sometimes they don't. So it's up to you. But uh, don't forget your vows. And if you feel like those vows are sliding away, you know, vows help us stay in the place we're supposed to be in. Help us stay committed. It's a commitment. We made a commitment to our spouse. We made a commitment to God. Stay where we've made those commitments. And, you know, you've heard the stories about how grass is greener on the other side. I'm going to say this in a church, churchified format here, okay? But you know why the grass is greener on the other side, right? Because there's a lot more manure over there. Just using a farm term there, you know. You can put your own word in later, however you want to do that. But it's, uh, that's, it's, uh, there's a reason why grass seems to be growing better someplace else. And uh, it's not always, uh, not always as good of a reason. You better put your boots on when you go over to that green grass, okay? That, that didn't cost you anything. But you could put a little extra offering for it. I'd appreciate it. Um, the next one is don't be alone with the wrong person. Do you know there's some people you just have chemistry with? You just naturally have chemistry with them. And that's great, and that's the spice of life. But if you have a lot of chemistry with them, you better not be hanging out alone. Because where there's plenty of chemistry, thank you, sometimes it doesn't take much of a match to strike that into something much greater. So uh, I, I would also put it this way. Don't be alone with the right person either. You know, I, I, and that might, you know, so you can, you can look at that either way. The wrong person or the right person, that's the same person we're talking about here, but however you view that. Then the next one is this, and, that, and, and see, Joseph found himself alone with this woman. Now, he was a slave. He had things he had to do. He came in the house. He did not know they were there alone, but because he was there alone with her, that's whenever she was able to take full advantage of him. Now, I, I got to thinking about something in this story because she grabbed his coat. Man, I was thinking if I was Joseph for the rest of my life, I would probably never own another cloak or coat like that. Because that got him in trouble with his brothers. It got him in trouble with this woman. I mean, I, you know, he probably is the guy who invented jeans and T-shirts. I'm thinking he is. It's like Pharaoh's going in and saying, hey, I got the vice president robe here for you. He's going, oh, no, 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 no. Could you just give me some jeans and a T-shirt? I'll be fine, you know. Uh, because that robe gets me in trouble. And uh, anyway, that was extra too. Um, but verse 12, what he did was whenever it got so intense that she grabbed him, he just got out of the coat and ran. So here, here are the three words. If you find yourself in a situation you just feel like you're losing control or the person's losing control, run, flee, vamoose, whatever you, whatever you, whatever you need to say, get out of here, get out. Go back up to uh, second, second Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. And God made that one really easy, the Bible, even though he didn't put the verses in, people did later, but uh, the, the numbering system. But that's real easy. Just remember Timothy and 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Everything's 2, okay? So you'll find it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, and, and, and remind yourself of this verse. The last one is, and this, you have, you have to take this away. You may not be rewarded for your faithfulness. He went to jail for doing the right thing. He went to jail. Now, realistically, he could have very easily been killed. My suspicion is that Potiphar, as mad as he was, and everything, he was humiliated in front of everybody. He was humiliated. The way his wife did it was humiliating to him. And the way she worded everything, you read those words and you see it. Here, here's, here's, here's what I tell you. That man had the power to kill him, have him killed. I think deep down someplace he's going, that wife of mine. <sighs> yeah. I'll bet Joseph, whatever, you know. I mean, so he stuck him, but he, but he was embarrassed. He's humiliated. He stuck him in prison. And, uh, but here's what I'm going to tell you. You may not be rewarded for your faithfulness. Be faithful anyway. Because there is an ultimate reward. There really is. And the rewards may be invisible to you right now. There will be a payday, and it's a good payday. I promise.